I'm proud to introduce Parker grad, Dr. Dar Griffith. Dar? Thank you. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's actually quite an honor to be back on this stage in a different light uh, than it was the last time. Uh, the last time I was walking across this stage about a dozen times, uh, I guess as valedictorian, you get an award for that. Uh, as a Parker Principal Associate, you get an award for that. So after a while, I got to just stand here during graduation because the guests kept calling my name. <laughs> So I was very honored when uh, Dr. McCauley asked me to, to a breakfast not too long ago. And he wanted to talk about his 100 days of listening, which was, man, what a phenomenal idea. And to his credit, he goes, well, I, I didn't come up with it. I totally stole it. And I said, well, OK, whatever. It's totally fine. I, I, I've stolen a lot of ideas and made them They're my, my own as well. Uh, and I've got some good news and I've got some bad news for a lot of you soon to be graduates. The, single try 10 student who stood up. <laughs> there are currently 60,000 active DCs in the United States, 60,000. There are 10,000 chiropractic students currently enrolled in colleges around the, around the country. You're gonna have about 150 to $200,000 in student loans by the time you walk out of here. And they're gonna ask you to start paying for it pretty much right out the gate. Four out of every 10 people walking around in the United States is currently under chiropractic care or some other alter alternative type of care. Only four out of 10. One out of every nine children is under chiropractic care. We have a lot to work on. The chiropractic college experience that I had may not be what you guys are experiencing now. So I'll talk about that here in a second. But, uh, kind of get a sense of where everybody is. How many students are in here or try one? Right, right. <laughs> That's how exciting it is at the beginning. And the gentleman from try 10? Barely lift his arm, right? Because that's how it feels after being in this place for four years. And there's some good and bad that you can take from it. My experiences coming to Parker and the Parker experience that I had uh, was on the cusp of Parker really becoming a name, not just as a seminar group, not just as a university, and not just what Dr. Mancini had in terms of a vision for this school, but it was a change in lifestyle for me. I had spent, I was in my early 30s by the time I got here, and I spent the majority of my life doing things that weren't exactly who I was. It was what people wanted me to be, but it wasn't really who I was. I was, I was a decent student in high school. I was a fairly decent student in college. And then one thing after another started to happen to change my path that ultimately led me to this place. Uh, it started a little bit in college when I finally discovered that besides being a band geek, I played eight years of trumpet, and yeah, you can actually overcome that. Uh, and, and I was top 5% of students in, in my high school class. But when I got to college, it was all about the college experience. I mean, I was free, yay, running around crazy doing whatever I could. Joined all the associations I could find and even rushed once. Uh, wasn't real too keen on that whole process, so I was like, mm, thanks, I'm out. <laughs> the irony is I ended, ended up joining the biggest fraternity in the world, the United States Navy. <laughs> Booyah. Uh, but it, during that process, you know, you have to take certain classes as part of the core curriculum. I had never been much of an athlete. I ran long distance, and I swam and dove in high school. Uh, and I also pole vaulted. Uh, 15 6, it's the highest jump I ever made. It didn't even qualify me for regions. But I had to do something, so I went into this multiple um, sports program at University of Texas San Antonio. And they had a volleyball program. Any volleyball players? Right on. So I got, I got into this program. I was like, oh, well, I don't know anything about volleyball. I always thought it was a girl sport. And at the time, that's all I ever saw play, uh, with the exception of maybe the beach guys. But this was all indoor. So I went in through the program. I was like, oh, man, this is kind of fun, meeting new people, all the rest of that. Well, I had, they had this thing uh, up by the basketball goal, which is one of those things where you just jump and smack the thing, see how high you can jump. Well, they tested everybody, and so I, you know, I'm like, 10 foot six. Not bad for somebody who's 5'11 on a good day. So I tried again. 
10 foot 10. I was like, apparently white guys can jump. <laughs> and so that immediately they took me into the program and next thing you know, I'm working out with the girls team at the University of Texas, San Antonio program and I'm learning how to play volleyball. And I am eating it up. What's not to love? I'm the only guy and there's 20 girls. <laughs> Hello? So it was a no-brainer for me, and I really learned and, and took it on. I took it on so much <clears throat> that I accidentally racked up about $43,000 in bills for credit cards, cars, apartments, chasing that dream of becoming a professional volleyball player. And again, because of my height, the only thing that really saved me is that I have a 76-inch wingspan, and I could jump at that time 42 inches, uh, which gave me a significant advantage to a lot of the people you know, taller than me or even guys my height. So I followed the tour around, and I mean, I racked up the bills. I slept in cars. I slept on the beach. I was a bum for years, but I couldn't live like that. I found out very quickly, you can't make, a, can't make a living doing that, really. Not at my height, really, and not without any college background or any of the rest of that. So I was like, okay, I'm in trouble. I got $43,000. What am I going to do? Well, Dad goes, yeah, well, you can either find a way to pay it off, go to prison, or join the service. All right, sign me up. What do I do? So I go into there, and the recruiter and the Army talk to me, the Navy talk to me, Air Force. Air Force has got a good gig. I mean, I like those armchair warriors. They're good. They can just joystick their way around anything, man. It's good times. I joke. I love the Air Force. They get me where I need to be. It's, and so I, it ended up I joined the Navy. And I'm going through boot camp, and you know, and you're just like, oh, I'm just beat down every single day. I'm there, and anything that I can do to just get out of it. So they're like, hey, we're, we're testing guys today, anybody interested? We're going to go do a little swim, a little run, some things. I'm like, yeah, yeah, anything to not have to do that. So I went off. They threw me in the water, told me to swim 500 meters. Didn't tell me what my time was. They pulled me out and said, hey, do some push-ups and sit-ups. Go hang on that bar and see how many pull-ups you can do, and then we're going to run a couple of miles. I was like, okay, great. I can do that. So I did it, and there were a dozen people at the time. Only two of us passed the test according to whatever numbers they had at the time. I had no idea. They said, congratulations, you've been selected for the basic underwater demolition school. Great, how much does it pay? I didn't realize that BUDS translates into SEAL training. Whoops. So I accidentally signed up for another two years in the Navy so I could go through this program. So I, I get there, and because my rate was hospital corpsman, they, they really needed hospital corpsman to get through this program. And it's not like they took it easy on me. If anything, they took it a little bit harder. But I am just the right size, and I was just fast enough, and I almost broke the obstacle course record by four seconds, had it been the official time. Uh, but then I damaged my knee, and I got rolled into another class, and finally finished six months later. 22 more months worth of training, I get assigned to a team. Now, in the early 90s, wasn't a whole lot going on. So guess what I did? played volleyball on the beach and accidentally got discovered by a master chief who was the head director of the Navy sports team. So I'm off three months out of every year playing volleyball for the United States Navy. Thank you, taxpayers. Appreciate it. <laughs> but it taught me a lot. It, uh, it, it, it gave me an experience that I never would have got any place else. Um, I learned a lot about myself during that whole experience, working in a teamwork environment. It kind of goes beyond any recognition of anything else I could think of. And it really prepared me to put my head back from where it was to where it needed to be. And then I, I got out and I was like, okay, I'm gonna go to school. And now I was serious. I was serious. So I actually went to class. I actually took notes and I actually listened. And I developed a way of learning and perceiving information, which some of which I'll share with you a little bit. And most of which I learned from the people, the faculty, they're actually sitting out in front of me right now. Uh, because there's a wealth of knowledge here most of you probably have not tapped into. Uh, we take it all for granted a lot of times. We'll talk about that later. So I got through that college experience and I, I took the MCATs because I was going to medical school. I'd spent eight years in orthopedics. It's all I knew. I wanted to cut. I wanted to fix broken bones and, and make a bazillion dollars doing it. That was what my goal was. Yes. Southwestern Medical University, here we go. September 2001, I start class. 
11 days later, I'm recalled. I'm out of class. So eight months, they pull me off. I do unspeakable things behind a desk. I didn't actually get sent anywhere. But during that time period, unbeknownst to me, because of the type of work that I was, had been involved with, all my transcripts had been pulled out of Southwest. My MCAT scores were gone. My interview was gone. So after eight months, March of 2002, they had no idea who I was. None whatsoever. I was like, hey, I'm ready to start back in class. When can I start? And they're like, and you are nothing. Now, thankfully, I was able to find the MCAT scores through their systems, all the rest of the stuff I was just going to have to redo. Only problem with that is going to be a year and a half later before I'd be able to class up. So there I was, no job whatsoever. Couldn't go to school for a while. My wife had picked up some work up in this place in Denton at some doctor's office I never even heard of. And so I just begged him for a job. Turns out, he's a Gonstead practitioner. Any Gondroids in here? Whoop, whoop. High pie, huh? So he told me a little bit what was going on, because these were the same people that I walked in and out of orthopedic offices I'd worked in for years. Same injuries, same illnesses, same everything. But no surgery. No medications. What in the world was he doing back there? And why was everybody in a gown? <laughs> so he finally told me. He put me through the entire process. I got my full spine films still. Um, they look like this before. They look like this now. But he really opened my eyes. I could still use my hands, which is really what my focus has been this whole entire time, doing something where I could use my hands. And then he introduced me to the Parker program. He had gone through when Jim was actually here. And when Mancini was here, he said, there's this really electrifying guy here. You got to go meet with him. Well, Mancini was busy as always. So I met with Vicky over at the uh, admissions department. That was on a Thursday. I started class the following Monday. That's how on board I was. And they took my transcripts and didn't even blink an eye. I was so excited. My very first day, I am listening to Dr. Gene Giggleman. And that's four pieces of chicken at Babes. Four. You get a breast, a thigh, a leg, and a, and a, th and, and a, and, and a breast. So it's all in there. So four pieces of chicken. And it's still, hold on, limbic system response, Maca. <laughs> that still triggers right in through here, and I get the creepy crawlies every time I see that in my head. But I was listening to him, to, to him talk, what part I could actually understand, because he's talking like this, and then about 100 miles an hour. But I was so impressed. But why was a veterinarian teaching anatomy at a chiropractic college? <laughs> Very confused, impressed but very confused. But it was at that time, after listening to him talk, and some of you may remember this from my, from my graduation speech, I actually wrote my valedictorian graduation speech that day. And I made it the only goal I had to do in going through this program by taking advantage of whatever anybody could teach me. Didn't matter who it was or what it was about at the time. We were required to go through nine chiropractic techniques. Those were the core techniques, nine. Is it still nine? Ish? No, not even close anymore? Whew, lucky. I mean, from Dr. Watts and Dr. Wells going chick -chick -chick, which saved my keister on more than one occasion. Thank you, Dr. Wells. Saved me at a couple of Cairo game events, coming back, my ankles all from playing volleyball. Fixed it right up. And even when Dr. Stern was here, nothing like a little toggle, you know, fresh egg on a piece of cracker right on the toggle board, Boop, not even a crack. That guy, crazy fast. Amazing. I took it all in. I was like, oh, give me more, give me more, give me more. Try two. I run into Dr. Mark Charette. Anybody know Dr. Mark Charette? Yeah. It's hard not to be a chiropractor or a chiropractic student and not know who Mark Charette is. He's been doing this for a long time. Well, I decided I was going to pick a fight with him. Because he had a bad flight the day I met him. Try to. I was just coming out of Dr. Drew's class, biomechanics. Some speaker was going to talk about legs or something. 
And so he comes in and he's all like, ah, that's, that's, and then talking to himself and then <laughs> setting up. And you know how he is. He's kind of <laughs> fidgety and does that kind of stuff. And I love it when he does that because I'm like, Mark, you okay, man? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you drink coffee or something? No, no, it's always like this. <laughs> all right. So he's coming in there and he's all like, all right, I'm going to start this all out by saying something. Who thinks I'm crazy? If I told you I could adjust a symptomatic knee in one or two visits and get it asymptomatic and have it hold for a year, who thinks I'm crazy? I'm like, yeah, you're crazy. And he turns around and he goes, who said that? I'm like, dun, 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 right here. <laughs> Fourth row back on the right-hand side, east 120. Got it. He goes, where are you from? I go, Texas. He goes, <laughs> figures. <laughs> really? Huh. Ready, let's go, out in the parking lot. So he goes through this, and of course, you know, he doesn't know that I've already worked through a lot of tests and teachers and trying to negotiate, if you will, a couple of extra points, because a lot of people really just don't take tests well, but are very smart people. So I'd, I'd try and work it out so that we could, you know, maybe a couple extra points here, a couple extra points there, try not to blow the curve too much. And so he does his whole presentation, he works on a couple of people in their knees, and he goes, by the time it, it's in, it's like, hey, where's that guy from Texas? And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, it's go time, baby. Let's go. Come on. So he brings me up there, and I'm about to tell him about no meniscus in the knee, compression fracture in my spine I didn't even know about until I saw my first chiropractor, and a bunch of other small issues that I'd had aches and pains for years. Go figure, training. And so he lays me down. He goes, lay down. Shut up. I got problems of my own. <laughs> I could see you were super successful in practice. And he was, actually. This was after he had already sold $2 million practices in Las Vegas and San Francisco. So he lays me down on the table, and he goes through this entire process, and I am like, oh, he is not going to get a peep out of me. Nothing, nothing. I'm not giving away nothing. So he does his thing, and I'm like, okay, what's this? And why is he touching that? And, oh, hey, that's not right. <laughs> Kidding about the last part. So he does his full spine assessment, and then he works on my feet, my knees, my hips, my wrists, my elbows, and shoulders. Now, prior to that, I'd been to Vegas seminar and had Leander adjust me, my ileocecal valve, and that was crazy. <laughs> but I had never been adjusted like this before. You know, Gonstetters, it's maybe one or two here, or there, and done, we're good. But this guy was giving me the once over. And I couldn't tell whether I was coming or going. I got up off the table, and he's like, So, how does it feel? And I'm like, After a couple steps, I'm like, I couldn't say anything. He's like, finally, speechless. So after it's all said and done, uh, the instructor for the class, Dr. Redenbaugh, introduces us and says, hey, Dar, why don't you tell Dr. Shrett what you used to do for a living? And I told him I was in the teams. I was at SEAL Team 5, uh, first group. And, and he kind of just went, oh, oh, hey, yeah, good night. <laughs> Thanks for not breaking my neck. Appreciate it. And then I just gave him this humongous hug because I really finally realized that chiropractic works, and I need to do that. And so the rest of the time that I spent in this college, I had to do more of that. Yeah. Teachers don't listen to this. I broke into treatment rooms so that we could practice. We took dummies, and we took this big heavy bag. I don't know if it's still over in the Gonstead Club. And we were just the side posturing that thing to death. You know, and I'm, sh -sh -sh, I'll do all that too, just because I wanted to see if it made a difference, if it fit me. So, and even if it did or didn't, it was an experience I took in. And I took advantage of every word that came out of everybody's mouth. From every MACA question to every word, even Dr. Farmer in the embryology department. <laughs> Love you, Dr. Farmer. <laughs> and by the way, the tautology of Fallot is not the only thing that you learn from that class. You actually learn that the right side of your cortex and the development of the neural tube is one of the primary functions that develops in the nervous system. So as we age, it's the part of the brain that degenerates more frequently and is associated with most chronic disease processes. And sitting through Dr. Campbell, unfortunately Dr. Campbell has left us a few years ago. He's, he's passed on, uh, fighting the good fight, and it eventually unfortunately got him. But even in his biochemistry class, going through the limbic system response Krebs cycle, 
all right? A citric acid cycle when you're actually oxidizing acetate to finally develop, you know, some substrates and other byproducts of cell metabolism so that your body can convert simple sugars, proteins, and fats into energy. And there are three NADH. <laughs> three. Board question. Know it. Now, if I told you where those rate-limiting substrates actually come out of, alpha-ketoglutarate, succinyl-CoA, and just after malate in the system. Ooh. <laughs> Dr. Campbell would be proud. And then to be able to sit through Dr. Marsman's class and figure out that the true nature of the best way for us to describe what it is we do, not just anatomically, not just through a subluxation complex, not just through the philosophy, is the nervous system. And after sitting through Dr. Hall, <laughs> who was not an instructor here at the time, between 2002 and 2005, or if he was, I never had the distinct pleasure. But after listening to him speak so passionately about it, going through the Carrick Institute program, and then finally meeting Dr. John D'Anafrio. Hey, give me a hat, come here. <laughs> and remember, it, it looks like, no, no, no. It appears to be, and it's always white hair, right? It's always white hair. But I was blessed to have these relationships with all of these fantastic people, all of these teachers, instructors, doctors, you know, some of which I would never have thought in a million years any of that information would ever be useful. My very first week into practice, I decided I was going to go back to Denton and I was going to honor the guy who got me started in the chiropractic idea by going to work for him. So once I'd gone through that valedictorian, you know, all the awards and all the rest of that stuff, it did mean something. I finished clinic in 18 weeks and I started in his clinic while I was still a student. And I will dispel a couple of rumors. At clinic camp, I don't know if this rumor is still floating around, I did in fact take the class president's tires off of his car and put it inside the bathroom. I did that. <laughs> did that. I also did dispense a smoke bomb into the ladies' dormitory at clinic camp. I, I, I might have done that too. Sorry, Dr. Thomas. <laughs> I, yeah, I know you did. Because <laughs> uh, they had this little uh, panel that I had to come speak to. And uh, I don't know who still got that on tape somewhere. I need that back. Because <laughs> I was Jesse Jackson it up like crazy. Oh, it was not me. You have the wrong man. <laughs> Lying, using that training. And yes, I did jump the 10 foot wall in one try and I did climb up the pole. I was the second. Tyler was actually faster than me by like three or four seconds. But I was the second fastest up the pole when all this is still being done out in Denton before that new facility out there. And, uh, fantastic. So during your clinic experience, it's okay to kind of let your hair down a little bit, even if you don't have any. Because that's all part of the experience too. You need a little, as Steve Weller would say, you got to have a little fun with your school experience in order to keep your balance. You know, we did three Cairo games, brought medals back every single time. Volleyball, I swam the last one. That was fun. But you need to balance. It's no different than when, when your learning experience should be like, too. You need to balance out what you're good at and what you're bad at. And this is where Dr. Charette taught me a lot of things. Most people don't know this. Dr. Charette is actually a PhD in education. And his first technique of choice was SOT. A lot of people didn't know that either. But he's a fantastic adjuster. And he's an even better educator with regard to how he appeals to the different ways people learn. How is it that I can remember that within the Principles of Neuroscience, third edition on page 597, that the mechanoreceptor depolarization that occurs once you put motion into tissue actually reflexively inhibits the sympathetic nervous system to create a cortical change, which then upregulates the release in the periocular ductal gray of the analgesic portion of your brain, and within the nuclei of Raphi Magnus, serotonin production that then through the reticular spinal pathway produces the endorphins and enkephalins that we get that initiates the, the response that inhibits nociceptive afferents to your brain. 
Now, some of you, you're right on there. Some of you, what? But that's OK. It's been eight years since I've seen that. But that is the one thing, if I had to stand up in a court of law, if somebody asked you right now, what happens every time you do an adjustment? And it was like, oh, well, I'm removing the subluxation complex, and I'm affecting the mobility of the, the, the uh, facet joints and the blah, 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 blah. OK, yeah, great. Do that in one sentence. And do it in a way that even any of those other people that work in the healthcare field, of which is dwindling in terms of the available good health care. Uh, Dr. McCauley mentioned the Affordable Care Act. Are you guys aware that in Clause 2706, that you are actually going to be allowed the same reimbursement rate as any other physician for the exact same code. Absolutely. Now they may give you a cap of 60 or 70 bucks, but you get paid the same as everybody else. It's a start. At least we're being recognized. But here's the caveat to that. This is a little bit of bad news. Some of you in here are gonna graduate and walk across the stage and be doctors of chiropractic and have no idea what that means. You will have taken every appropriate test. You'll be as smart as the school and your abilities have allowed you to do so. But you probably have never really experienced a true chiropractic adjustment, either given or received. And some of you are fantastic adjusters, but can't take tests and can't express yourself in front of a crowd or to another chiropractor, let alone a medical doctor, a doctor of osteopathic medicine, a neurosurgeon, or an orthopedist. So this is where I took that caveat. I wanted to go back to my roots in orthopedics. So when I worked in the Denton office, I was focusing on building relationships involving medical doctors sending patients to me. Because they should. They don't want to treat those people. They just give scripts out. And it's their job to do that. That's what they're trained to do. I got something to fix up. <laughs> Three, four, five keeps the diaphragm alive, right? But going through that process of trying to figure out what I was going to do when I got out of practice, I really had to depend on the support staff here. I, I, I appealed to Dr. Greg Page, wonderful out in practice, tremendous ideas in marketing, really knew how to expand the knowledge and in integrative care model. His roundtable idea of taking a patient's case and presenting it to both their PCP, if they would give you the time of day, and speaking a language that they would understand. Neurology, anatomy, biochemistry. Keeping home in my heart the philosophy and the principles that were taught to me by Parker, but using something that they would understand. If I said subluxation, they say, what's almost dislocated? They don't know what that means. And frankly, in some schools, we're not quite sure what it means either. But I needed that. I needed to figure out a way to do it. So as I was working in that, in that office in Denton, I got hooked up with a couple of primary care guys. Went through the whole entire process, showed me what it is they do on their intake. I said, you know what, I, I see those people, these people too. He goes, you don't treat carpal tunnel. No, but I can help manage the functionality of that wrist by doing my adjustments and by performing those rehabilitative efforts to strengthen up that carpal arch so the lunate doesn't crush the carpal bones, even after you've already released it once. And it usually reoccurs within five years because that's scar tissue. So the mechanical effects have been missed. And he's like, what? Show me the evidence. Boom, here you go. Where did I get that? From these instructors down here, from your teachers. All of it. Every bit of information you guys have been given from the time you start here at the school to the time you walk across the stage arms you with the right information. And the more you know, the less afraid you'll be about what it is you do. You know, a lot of medical doctors are more progressive nowadays. You can talk to them about this kind of stuff as long as you're armed with the right information. Because they're just as afraid too. Oh, we cause strokes. No, we don't. There are a lot of things that cause strokes. There's a lot of underlying effects. 
That's not your concern. Your concern is helping people that want to be helped in a way that nobody else can. There is not another form of healthcare other than chiropractic that treats the body the way that we do as a whole entity. And when you start to talk to other colleagues and medical doctors about that kind of approach, world of difference. Oh, oh, oh you, you are a real doctor. Yeah, and I can kick your ass. So I started to go out in town and we found these relationships and I built upon that. We built a brand new office in Lake Cities, ready to go. At around that same time, another group had in been interested in, in our program and wanted me to come work in a hospital. I was like, eh, I don't know if I want to do rounds again. I certainly don't want to be around bedpans again. That was no fun. So I turned them down. Not once, not twice, three times. Friday, we get our equipment, we put it in the brand new building. We're about to get our site inspection on Monday. Saturday night, the building catches on fire and burns to the ground. Now, I am not a deeply religious person, nor do I believe in signs, but that's a heads up, something's not gonna work out. So needless to say, I called that group of guys over at the hospital and said, uh, you know, I turned you down a couple of times. If it's still open, I, I'd be willing to come and at least talk to you about it. So they brought me on board and I started seeing patients in the clinic that same day. Again, just another accident in my life for all I knew. Being directed by some other means. So I set up this relationship with doctor after doctor. There were nine physicians in this facility at Las Colinas Medical Center. They're all still there. The Tiana Health Group is still over there. Most of those doctors are part of the surgical group and the Victory Medical Systems that uh, I'm also a co-owner in. So besides being the executive clinical director for First Health Group, I'm also the chiropractic and physician liaison to the MSO, which is our business partners in healthcare. Because I took that idea, that model of working with medical doctors, and we blew it up. Spoke their language, showed them what the true meaning of chiropractic is, treating the patient as a whole person. World of difference. And after six years, they decided that uh, we needed to go more global with, if, if you will. We now have 25 offices. We have 25 offices uh, that I oversee all the operations and procedures for. And several of those clinics are currently run by Parker graduates. And some of you at some point in time may also be doing the same. If you study, if you take advantage of the wonderful gifts that are being given to you every single day from the instructors and teachers of this institution. Because your Parker experience is what dictates your success. One of the bottom, if you will, students in our class made his first million dollars, Ben Kiros, within five years of being in practice. Five years. Now there's a little bad news. Out of the 60 some odd pa people that graduated with me, only 39 of them are still in practice, because it's hard. It's hard to do the right thing. You can do an associateship and go work for somebody. I tried that, building burned to the ground. You can work for a group, which actually did turn out to be a very good idea for me because somebody else put the bill and I got to just learn as I went, even better. Or you could open up on your own, like a lot of my classmates did. My best friend, the godfather to both my younger kids, Dr. Jorge Nieto, uh, one of the awards we got at uh, graduation ceremony was, uh, you know, how they give out the most successful student and most likely to succeed. Jorge and I got best couple. <laughs> Dr. Mancini about laughed himself to the floor. That may be the only time that's ever happened. But Jorge decided he was going to go off and do it on his own. So he developed the, uh, the ultimate function chiropractic. Do the math. That's right, the UFC. Jorge was a former UFC fighter and bare knuckles champion in Southwest region. Uh, we hit it off the first day when we had to stand up in line and give us a little story about who we were. And from that point on, we were literally attached to the hip. Wherever he went, I went, and he always likes to joke, you know, he was the wind beneath my wings, really. <laughs> he, he didn't want to be valedictorian. He said, Dar, you go ahead. That's fine. I, I'll, I'll do that for you. But he's been great because his take on chiropractic 
is more the emotional connection that he has with his patients. He has an ability to convey a very complex thought process, unlike me, who likes to throw out flossy nasi nihila pilification, which means something of little or no value, just like the word. He can turn that into something that a patient can actually understand. So all that you know, reflexing and up or down six levels and what happens hypertonically above T6 and below T6, he can say, it'll hurt here, I can fix that. It'll hurt here, I can fix that too. He has that gift. And, and I learned a little bit of that too. You know, and so much so that I finally convinced him to take over the office in Las Colinas and he is killing it. Not, not literally, he doesn't fight anymore. Really. <laughs> and the patients absolutely love it. You know, you see this big tattooed Chulo looking guy come into the room. Hey, welcome to the office. <laughs> I'm going to take care of you. <laughs> I've helped him. He, he's got a speech pediment, really. <laughs> but he's absolutely my best friend. And another reason why your Parker experience is so enriched by the people that are around you. I took advantage of the gifts that he'd been given, the things that I didn't possess, and turned them into a plus for me. So you don't have to believe everything that's being told to you, and you don't even have to believe half of it. But you do have to take away something from it, no matter what it is. Your Parker experience will dictate how successful you are in practice by being able to take the knowledge you've learned here and express yourself out in the field in a way that makes you sound intelligent, because you should be after this much time in school. It makes you successful because you're able to get across the knowledge that you've been given and the chiropractic message that we all know in, in our deepest of hearts. That chiropractic works does your chiropractor. Right. I think we've got to do some, some Q&A, right? And I appreciate you guys listening to me ramble and walk around and make fun of people. But thank you so much for your time.